bueno. Actually, I don't have time anymore because always uh, used up my time, so we can go for lunch, right? <laughs> Oh, you love this job, I guess, and you present it like you forgot the time. Welcome to Turkey, huh? Uh, so, uh, good morning to all, and uh, I'm uh, extremely humbled and uh, honored to be invited uh, to this excellent organization. I thank you, Bülent and Savaş. Uh, for inviting me and also organizing this event. I hope you will continue to do this. And uh, I will talk about this, uh, what is the latest research on 5G architectures? So that means we'll be here the next two hours and then <laughs> I will finish on time. And uh, deployment cases and, uh, and also what after, right? Because people talk about 6G, 7G, I say, why don't you say 19G, right? So uh, you see also I am uh, with uh, Georgia Tech since 33 years. I was one of the youngest, now I'm one of the oldest, unfortunately. And then you also see Russia, right? USA and Russia. And uh, 15 years ago, I realized I reached really the top of my career, for me at least. And then I started to be international and I started to open up and I went to different uh, countries, like I created a center in South Africa for mine applications, and then I did uh, something in Finland, uh, finished Distinguished Professor program, and under Humboldt Award, I did uh, work in Germany, and I created a center in Barcelona and Politecnica Catalonia. So, you know, many countries. I also saw uh, Saudi Arabia, by the way, it's a hot topic now, uh, in Jeddah, in King Abdullah's University. So this here is about mega grant. Uh, Putin and Medvedev actually, you know, yesterday I was in Moscow and Medvedev was there in this open innovation forum. And uh, so they have this program called mega grant, a huge amount of money. Actually, I do all these things for you know, helping these countries, right? Of course not. So you know, there's all money involved in this thing. So they give these, uh, you know, they give these uh, uh, opportunities and uh, so last July, we applied for this program. And uh, out of 360 applications, uh, in all areas, by the way, from medical field, to agriculture, medicine, whatever you can think of, and only 30 received the uh, grant. It was in December. And out of 30, only two are non-Russians. So one of them is me. So thank you. <laughs> So uh, yesterday I was in panel, uh, as I said, they didn't believe because they said, you must have some Russian background. No, you know, I'm last guy from, <laughs> so anyhow, so let's talk about the uh, 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 thing about, uh, you know, everybody talks about 5G and, you know, many people just hear things and then they say, oh, you know, I know about 5G. So I thought I will uh, set the record straight and I will explain about 5G. So what are the objectives of 5G? As you see here, Compared to 4G, like LTE, LTE Advanced, uh, we are trying to reach ultra high capacity, meaning 1,000 times more capacity per square kilometer, and uh, mobile cybersecurity, much tighter security aspects, and also very, very high data rates. I call it how ultra high data rates, meaning 100 times more uh, uh, data rates than the LTE or LTE Advanced, for example. We are talking about 10 gigabit per second peak data rates. And also, like this IoT is now, I'm working on the sensor since maybe 20 years now. So it's a big deal now, IoT, uh, meaning connection of millions and billions of things and people. And uh, we have all these different systems always connect to the best networks. And energy savings like green communication. And of course, reduce latency, uh, almost less than one millisecond objective. It's almost zero latency. And the last but not least, it's called flexible network architecture. That's the topic of this, uh, of this morning's uh, uh, session. Uh, softwareization, cloudification, SDNs, virtualization, all of that is under that uh, flexible network architectures. So when you look at all the research uh, in companies and universities, uh, uh, main performance objectives for these new directions are maximiz max maximization, maximization 
maximizing the data rates. Sorry, I only four hours sleep. So latency minimization and energy minimization and uh, reliability maximizing or maximization. And uh, what are the uh, differences compared to 4G LTE and uh, derivatives of LTE? So when you look at all of this, we already have them in LTE and derivatives, right? Like IoT, millimeter waves, I put their terahertz band because I will talk about it later. Massive MIMO, green communications, multiple access techniques like OFTM and then you know, variations of OFTM, small cells, ultra densification, de 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 device to device communication, and of course, big data, mobile cloud computing, edge computing, AIs, and machine learning. So these are really the uh, enabling or key technologies for 5G. But then when you look back 10 years, we were all doing these things before. So what the major paradigm shift is, exactly the top things about softwareization, SDN, NFV, virtualization, cloudification. So that's the new paradigm shift moving from the 4G domain to 5G domain. So if somebody asks about that, that's really the major paradigm shift. Everything else is the same, plus, of course, improving all of this, right? And uh, so, uh, I, in the first part, I will, of course, as I told you, I may need two hours to explain to you. So, uh, uh, look at the, from the architecture perspective, I want to give you this uh, overview about uh, existing architectures in the world. Uh, I call them first generation uh, SDN and FE based architectures or 5G architectures. So, this first one was from Princeton and AT&T, and the second one is from... Uh, uh, Barcelona, the CCTC, and then Cloud Run is from China Mobile, and then Entity Docomo had this extended Cloud Run, and then South Korea Telecom had this architecture. Whatever I present to you, these are the last, say, three, four years. So brand new things. So the first generation, they some of them looked at the core, some of them look at the uh, RAN part. So South Korea Telecom is the first one. They tried to look at both core and RAN. And they all suffered from, we call this IQ transmissions, because they're using this front hall network, which is like optical network, and IQ transmissions were creating a lot of traffic, and that front hall bottleneck was the biggest problem for the first generation systems. Then uh, in Europe, of course, uh, there's a lot of activity, as you see here like Nokia and Imdia from Madrid, and Orange Labs has this project content, and Metis, the famous Metis, like Madrid Grid, the tool that you may, you may have heard, Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, and the University of Politecnia Valencia, and Orange, and the iJoin, and then like Crowd, Juniper Networks. So they again looked at RAN and Core, and uh, of course, uh, orchestration, uh, softwareization, and all that. So they all had some uh, issues about, uh, uh, again, uh, different uh, problems like scalability problem, for example, or full virtualization. So these were all problems of the first generation of these architectures. Then we had this project, software project. Uh, it was uh, uh, supported by National Science Foundation in the United States and also Huawei headquarters. Uh, we did a lot of work on the architecture part and the management tools of all these different schedulers and the uh, traffic engineering solutions. And we got seven patents of this with Huawei. And uh, then the second generation, you see in three years, we have the second generation systems. Uh, all of them, again, Metis 2 is, for example, uh, Vodafone's and Ericsson's uh, next generation mobile network. So these are all now ongoing projects. And uh, I have these red ones. You heard about it uh, from uh, Guru, an old friend of mine many years ago, and also O's in length. Open Network Foundation has this M cord, which is the most powerful, in my opinion, uh, and also most successful so far uh, in the world. And they have a lot of interesting solutions. And I will explain to you. So for example, uh, they support MP4 switch, for example and they support uh, uh, a virtualization of the core network, and, uh, and that's like by the XRAN, and then the slicing, the RAN slicing, 
is done by program by the Argila, for example. And always mention some more about it. And uh, uh, they also have this full uh, uh, integration of the backbone and also the run part. And I say here, the, the only problem I could find is uh, single functional split. Maybe it's not true anymore, we'll see. And uh, uh, we have this uh, uh, Arbat, by no means we can uh, compete with these fellows, but Arbat is uh, my product uh, in uh, Russia, Moscow, with Russian Academic Science, my people, that uh, uh, we created this. So what we are trying to do is, remember the performance objectives, minimum latency, we are, again, uh, always had this slide with all these latency milliseconds. So we are trying to create the flat integrated architecture, no more uh, uh, distinctions between the core and the RAN network. We created this white box, or we call it universal network device, UND. So you can put any of these devices we have under that umbrella, and then we are creating an, uh, a flat architecture, which can also help us not only reduce latency, but also very, very flexible for all these different radio access technologies. And of course, many other things. So this is, I just started, by the way, in May. I was there four months, back and forth. But so these are the, you know, very talented young people, as you can see here. So we'll hire some more people, of course. And then these are the things that we are doing, like uh, universal network device, that's the, the new concept that we have and uh, uh, unifying RAN and the uh, backbone, no more distinctions, no more hierarchies. And then we have extreme platform, which uh, uh, will also uh, uh, take care of a lot of these interesting uh, video type applications on you know, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality type applications. And then we have also uh, service bridge or orchestration and all these things, we still have a lot of time to do. And uh, so one of the problems is, uh, of these architectures that although they are called open architecture, I talked to always many times to have access to their tools so that we can do comparisons because the comparisons I showed you, they're all qualitative. So quantitative, I need the tools and it's open architecture, but you cannot have access. So it's really like chicken and egg problem. So that's supposed to be somehow uh, uh, done, uh, uh, taken care of soon, right? For the researchers especially. And the, the next part is about deployments. So everybody talks about 5G deployments, right? So a lot of uh, 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 operators say, oh, we'll have the uh, uh, 5G, you know, soon, the end of 2018. Uh, although AT&T president said that, but, you know, that's actually happening the last 35 years with all this Gs that was also shoved. Like, really, everything is evolution. So, like, they say 5G, and actually, it's like slowly you know, introducing these 5G characteristics. So it was the same was uh, 4G and same was in 3G, right? So, uh, so like they have this LT advance with all these nice uh, uh, like uh, qualms and massive MIMOs. And they said this is already pre-5G, right? So in Europe, there are 5G trials with all these leading companies. And the, the actual... Five, and again, they say, you know, f first uh, uh, deployments, all these uh, uh, companies, the leading companies in the United States, they start to deploy, again, you know, uh, in quotes, uh, 5G uh, uh, in the spring of 2019. And also in other, you know, European countries and in, in, in Asia, they will start to deploy 2019. By 2020, they will be uh, more and more full-fledged uh, 5Gs coming out or will come out. And uh, actually these are really, what are, they are doing is parts of these 5G concepts, right? They talk about uh, millimeter waves deployments, right? 60 gigahertz or you know, 30, 40 gigahertz equipment, like they use this uh, typical company equipments. And uh, the first deployments are in these major cities like Atlanta, Dallas, etc. right? And then they have this first net uh, a public safety broadband platform nationwide. They are using 700 megahertz spectrum. And then Verizon, again, you see fixed uh, wireless access. They launched the millimeter waves uh, again in 2018. And they do not follow the 3GPP release 15 standard. They have their own you know, structure there. And they have these uh, uh, launch cities like Sacramento in California, Houston, 
LA and Indianapolis. And they also have small cells deployments in different uh, uh, cities and street poles and uh, street lights, like again, mostly California uh, cities and, and Boston. And they're using 29, uh, 28 to 39 gigahertz spectrums. Then the T-Mobile, they have a, uh, this uh, first, first 5G smartphones, because we cannot use these phones that we have for 4G. They will be uh, uh, getting them out in early 2019. And uh, actually Verizon, I will come back to it maybe, they will use this Motorola uh, Moto Z3 or something, a new product, 5G product. So they have this, again, typical in New York City, uh, Los Angeles, Dallas, etc. They will deploy this. Again, you see, uh, you know, millimeter wave deployment is seen as kind of 5G here. What they're trying to do is, their objective is, uh, they're using 600 megahertz. They're trying to cover two thirds of the United States with over 25 megahertz per second data rates. Again, by far, you know, from our 5G objectives when you compare the results. And then by 90% 90, uh, 90 by 2024. And again, over, you know, these uh, map shows uh, 600 megahertz and over 600 megahertz spectrums. And then Sprint has this, they call it beautifully designed 5G phone will come out soon. And they are uh, upgrading their towers, uh, you know, the base stations uh, for uh, 800 megahertz, 1.9 gigahertz and uh, 2.5 gigahertz. They are using small cells, over 100,000, they call this spring magic boxes and uh, in uh, 200 different cities. And again, they are talking about 2019 massive deployments of this uh, 5Gs, especially in the six cities. And uh, so now spectrum is a problem, right? Uh, there are many trials, as you see here, 32% the trials are in the one to six gigahertz spectrum bands, 39% is above six gigahertz, like most of you know, uh, these millimeter waves type. And then uh, sub, one, uh, sub one gigahertz are the 28%. And these are all different countries. I couldn't find Turkey, so I'm sorry if it's, uh, it's not here. But uh, so these are the spectrums. And uh, you know, there are all these spectrum band requests, like you know, 3.7, for example. I just got yesterday a message uh, uh, that NDIA president was asking uh, US uh, FCC 5.7 gigahertz should be released for unlicensed band access. They say unlicensed band is really uh, uh, needed uh, uh, urgently. So, you know, all the spectrum bands are also in the discussions, right? And uh, so let me go back here. Uh, there are many use cases. Some of them are mentioned here, and uh, also you could see all these different cases. So 74% of the use cases in the priority enhance mobile broadband. You can see some of them are ultra fast internet, like again, gigabytes per second as 5G's objectives, enhanced video communication, integrated mobile video customer experience, early uh, augmented and virtual realities, and uh, work and play in the cloud. And then uh, uh, ultra uh, reliable low latency communications. It was also mentioned before by Oz. Like again, uh, but it's very small percentage for the time being, like advanced uh, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality, and connected and autonomous vehicles, and uh, you know, car to car communications, and industrial and vehicular automation, and all these uh, mission, uh, mission critical broadband. And you see massive IoT is 21%, but I assume this will really take off more. Even as I mentioned to you in Russia, everybody, you know, all the Medvedev was their prime minister, and he said that they will invest $2 trillion, uh, uh, trillion dollars, you know. Uh, so to all this automatizing smart country, they call it, digital transformation. So all of these uh, are also under the massive IoT. So I hope I gave you all these deployment cases and use cases about the frequency bands and also about 5G. So what is after 5G, right? So these are all, these are my love. That doesn't mean that's supposed to be, right? People were talking about 6G, 7G, etc. So. 
these are really interesting topics. I love them. I hope someone will love it. I call this intelligent communication environments. And a little bit later on, terahertz, because everybody, like I started 12 years ago, terahertz band. And now people woke up and they say, oh, you know, there is terahertz band. We can do something there. We have a lot of patents, by the way. I don't know if they will bring some money or not. So Internet of Nano Things, Internet of Bio Nano Things for Health Applications, and Internet of Space Things, CubeSat Communications. So these are really, I mean, I love them, but so. What are these intelligent communication environments? Please, you know, if you're a researcher or investor, think about this. So we have these reflect arrays, right? They only support normal reflections. When the signals come and they just reflect them, right? So with these intelligent environments, we are trying to create, we call them meta surfaces using certain materials like nanomaterials, like metamaterials or graphene. That was also from my past with the Internet of Nano Things. So we are creating these, we call them hypersurfaces, programmable metasurfaces. So they will do control reflection of the signals, polarized reflections, and absorptions. So it's really a very hot topic. Uh, of course, some of you may say, oh, these are relay. They are not your father's relay, by the way. It's not relay. Relays have a lot of delays and all that, so plus very expensive. So, you know, European community future emerging technology is extremely uh, very competitive, like 3% acceptance rate. We got 4 million euros. So we are trying to create this. And uh, we will be supporting any, you know, from 1 gigahertz to up to 10 terahertz in the future. So we are, uh, so the leader is fourth. There's a research center in Greece, Crete. And then uh, uh, I have this affiliation with the University of Cyprus. <laughs> really. So then Alto University, Fraunhofer Institute, and UPC. We just published this uh, communication magazine. Uh, you can see all these Greek names and myself, right? So it looks like I'm patched, but the interesting thing is they didn't take me because, you know, I'm last guy, but they took me because I gave a keynote speech in 2011 in uh, uh, Nicosia. Actually, it was Larnaca, Ayanapia. So they love this talk about nano things and nano materials, and they came up with these ideas, and then I trashed them in 2014. It was called White Snow. And then we worked together and together, and then we created this wiser surf. So we finally we got it, and so we are working on it. There are many physics people and materials people, communications. So it's a huge project, by the way. I hope some of you can access this and read it. So as you see here, these are all you know tiles we will be creating. So it also will use AI and machine learning to make these tiles very uh, you know intelligent, right? So I hope you get the point here. So Internet of Nano Things, uh, I started 2006 in Barcelona. I created the Nano Networking Center in Catalonia. So we try to, because when you look at the IOTs, micro things, they're all very uh, 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 intrusive. Like, you know, you don't want to have all these micro things around, right? So can we do Nano Things, for example? So that's why we published in 2010 in this magazine, bunch of, I got a lot of projects for, for this. And look here, 2016, American, uh, uh, Scientific American put this article, uh, I had nothing to do with it, Internet of Things goes nano. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are also working on this now. And then Internet of Bionana Things, it's all with the inside of the body. When you look at, there are all these really like networking devices, molecular motors, hormones. You can create a communication network inside of the human. You can also create artificial hormones and calcium signals. You can inject into the body and they communicate with each other and they can attack any of these diseases, tumors, and uh, hopefully our lifespans will be longer, right? So I'm working on it also since 12 years. And then we want to create this internet backbone, right? It's a like cyber physical system, closed loop. So we have a lot of activities going on that on this here too. And then the last one is Internet of Space Things. So it's not like I go to uh, Istihare or whatever it's called, and then next day I come with these ideas. So like for example, I used a lot. Of, I did a lot of work for NASA in 1990s. Also, Internet, Planetary Internet. I remember I gave a talk here in 2004, Interplanetary Internet, but with NASA's you know, problems, 
uh, we got out of there. But then I was uh, invited by University of New Mexico for a seminar. And I, there is an Air Force Research Lab, AFRL, in uh, Albuquerque, in New Mexico. And I saw these CubeSats there. I couldn't believe that. I mean, I, you know, it, it has been existing since many time, years, but so I really got excited and I, I started to work on it two years ago. And uh, so I learned that, that CubeSat was introduced by California uh, Polytechnic Institute in 1999. So these are really like very small, like the unit is one U means 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, max size, very small, like kind of, kind of nano microsatellites. It's not that expensive to produce them. Where you launch them and then, you know, when they're, when they're dead, so what? So you produce more and send them in. And so it's very, very powerful technology. And I said, why don't we create something like that, right? So we create this, uh, uh, we have new design, we apply for patent for it. So what we will do is, we'll let them uh, operate in terahertz bands. Because in the space, there are no atmospheric uh, 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 effects when you have terahertz in the in the atmospheric like in the terrestrial environment all these water particles uh, uh, affect the signal propagation the distance is limited so you cannot go beyond one meter or two meters we've worked a lot on those how to extend that actually those uh, intelligent platforms came from that idea by the way so to extend the distance of the terahertz communication systems. So in the atmosphere, I mean, in the, in the space, there are no atmospheric uh, uh, effects. So we can say there is no uh, uh, distance problem. So we'll operate them in terahertz. And then from here, we will uh, use SDN and FV. And then we will be, uh, we also create reconfigurable radio uh, uh, front ends. Actually, this is also a US, uh, like the DARPA and the, uh, uh, Semiconductor Research Corporation has $50 million investment. How do we create reconfigurable radios from the one gigahertz up to 10 terahertz without the switch over times between these uh, frequencies? So it's like dynamic spectrum access, but not like, you know, finding this uh, and then going there, etc. So uh, avoid the, uh, the uh, effects of this uh, switching delays. So we will have all these different uh, spectrum usage from the uh, uh, Earth segment to the space segment. And uh, so these are the uh, designs of the hardware. The, uh, you know, it's very simple to design these uh, cube sets, right? So, and, uh, but with a lot of uh, uh, ideas like uh, uh, reconfigurable front end, we have a patent on thousand by thousand, we call this ultra messy MIMOs. And then all this, uh, uh, you know, like multi-frequency transceiver design. And then we will use STN and FE because that's very powerful concept. It can easily be uh, connected to the 5G, right? And, and also it's easy to always change the software and uh, do all of these things, right? So first time I use this thing, by the way, thank you. Sayın Akyıldız çok teşekkür ediyoruz.